It's my privilege and opportunity to share with you the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. As you've probably gathered from your bulletins and where we're going, we're teaching a series called Christian Living in This World. And we're going to be walking you through 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and the book of Jude. So actually, that's plenty of reading. Uh, Not so much reading that you couldn't do it even actually in just a few minutes' time. But we hope you'll focus on these words, uh, hear them, let them just set your heart ablaze, and be prepared for that which Pastor Keith has been told to say this morning. The Word of God for the people of God. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message that you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. It is truth seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. And anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light. And there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness... They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Praise be to God. Let us pray. God, as we worship this day, the last day of the month of April, there are millions that worship now or at different hours during this day. And yet the same gospel is given to each one of them. We are one body with many different pieces. Some of them come with much more pigment in their skin than we come today, some less. Some come in much finer human-built edifices than we do, some least grand and opulent. Some come and pray to you saying, Merci, Jesu. Gracias a Dios. Merci, Jesse. Thank you, God. But we are all one, Lord, because you are one. And there is one darkness and one light, and you call us to be the children of the light. So when this man, your son, our pastor Keith, comes to speak your word today, let nothing abate him from telling the truth. Let nothing slow him from making the call upon our souls, Lord, so that we might be those who live in the darkness. Every sermon, Lord, has a pinpoint on our hearts somewhere. Let us receive it. Merci, Jesse. Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you. Mike will talk a little bit more about his trip, um, and you'll hear more in the announcements. But he got, he got home at 3 o'clock in the morning this morning. I know that because that's when my wife walked in the door, and she was on the same airplane. So, after the sermon, I expect you to go to bed, young man. <laughs> Well, it's good to be here with you this morning. Last week, we began this sermon series talking about this Christian living in, in this world with this, this mindset that John puts forth to us about uh, this or that. And we talked about that and this last week, didn't we? And last week, as we looked at the, the first part of, of 1 John, we looked at the way that he describes these two realities that exist in our world, the, the reality of darkness and the reality of light. And how when you walk in the light of God, that, that you can have fellowship with each other. And that's really what he's, he's encouraging these Christians. He's saying, as we walk together in the light, we have fellowship. And today, we're going to talk about what this fellowship looks like. And the, the two words that you see above this are, are two different Greek words for love. Because John is expressing to us today that that when we walk together, as, as verse 10 says, he says that when you love your brother and sister you, and you live in the light, there's nothing that can make you stumble. So today we're going to talk about this idea of what a gospel-centered friendship looks like in the world. And in the context of 
the types of love that we have for each other, because that's what John talks about. He says, God is love. Now, in the English language, we really have one word for love, and it's simply love. But in the Greek language, there's several words that mean love. And agape is, is the, the word for love that I think most of us are familiar with. And, and basically what it means is this. It's the highest form of love, charity, and the love of, the love of God for man and man for God. So that's agape love. It's, it's, a, it's a familiar term to many of us um, because it's the love that God has for man and that, that we're called to have for God. But not all love is created equal. You know, we say things like, you know, well, I love God. But then we also say things like, you know, I love cheeseburgers. And, you know, the, the love for one is not equivalent to the type of the other. I mean, when, so we sort of modify things, don't we? Have you ever talked to like a junior high student about whether they, they love somebody or like somebody? And they say, well, I like him, but I don't like him like him. And I love him, but I don't love him love him. We just, you know, repeat it to try to give emphasis to it. But in the Greek, they have actually different words. And this word agape is the word that, that when you think of, of love, I want you to think of it in terms of an ultimate type of love. But there's this other word for love called philia. And, 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 and here's what philia means. It's, it's more of a, of a surface level type of love. It says to have a special interest in someone or something, frequently with focus on close association, have affection for, like, consider someone a friend. So philia is not a bad thing. It's just not an ultimate thing, if you, if you understand what I'm saying. Philia is, yeah, we're, we're, we're pals. We hang around. We, we like each other. We, we do stuff together. But agape is this extra level of, of connection at the soul, right, that happens when a person walks in the light of Christ. And that's what John is encouraging us to walk in and enjoy the fellowship of because we live in the light. So I'm going to talk to you this morning about what, I, what I'm going to refer to as gospel-centered friendship and characteristics of a gospel-centered friendship and agape friendship. And, and here, here's what they are. Here's what they are. And you'll see how they differ between the world's way and God's way when it comes to relationships. And the, the first characteristic of, a, of an agape friendship is that it's built on Christ. It's built on Christ. You know, there was a, there's a... a a story in Matthew's gospel where Jesus is gathered in a room in a house and there's people crammed into this house to hear him teach. And he's with his disciples. And there are, there are people just crammed in. And someone comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside. They've come to, to talk to you. And Jesus, it says in, in, in Matthew 12, 49 to 50, he says, in stretching his hand toward his disciples, he said, behold my mother and bro- my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus was, was taking something that was incredibly important to people, which was the family unit. In, in, in a first century Middle Eastern culture, there was no more important group of people in the world than your family. You know, in our society and culture, the emphasis is often placed on the individual. In their culture, it was all about the family. That was the most important thing. And they came to Jesus and said, your family's out there. And he says, hey, whoever does the will of my father is my family. Now, he wasn't downgrading his relationship with his earthly family. What he was doing was, he was saying to to these people, it doesn't matter if we have blood relationship or not. It doesn't matter if we've come from the same place. If we have the same God, if we walk in the same light, so to speak, then we are family. And gospel, gospel-centered friendship is built on that kind of relationship. You know, the, the world tells us that we're to be friends with people that look exactly like us and talk exactly like us. In, in fact, a couple weeks ago, one of our one of our little 412 kids was in here, and she was she was getting ready to to, uh, to play in the band, and she brought a friend with her to, to church. And I was I was teasing her because her and her friend look exactly alike. They both have long brown hair. They're both wearing black leggings and gray sweatshirts. And I looked at it. I said, are you only friends with people that look just like you? Is that, on, is that your, your test? And they're like, what are you talking about? But it's true. Sometimes, if, if you look, look at the people that you spend time with, oftentimes, as your friends. We tend to clump together with groups of people that are just like us, don't we? And, and, and 
our, our circles can kind of become pretty close and tight, and, and we, we clump together. And of course, you know, in church, we kind of do the same thing too. You know, we have this group of people and that group of people, and they meet together to talk about this, and they meet together and talk about that. I mean, Jesus is basically saying, look, our, our common thing is not, you know, what we look like or how old we are or anything like that. Our common thing is Jesus. And that common thing is so strong and powerful that you can be like family with someone who's completely unlike you. And that's really the basis of your relationship. It's a powerful thing when, when you have that. Um, one, of my, one of my good friends is, is a guy named Craig Peters. You guys probably, a lot of, some of you know Craig Peters. He's a pastor. He's in Shuiville right now. And him, Craig and I served together in ministry for 13 years when I was in Des Moines. But I've, I've known Craig since I was a little kid going to camp. And when I first um, went to work with Craig on staff at, at the church, um, Estelle and I were there, and we've known them since before we were married. And, and I remember going over to Craig's house on Sunday, on Sunday evenings. We would do that periodically. And one of the times we went over there, in the, in the very beginning of our friendship, we're sitting around, and it got to be about maybe 8 o'clock at night. We were having a great time, and then we kind of noticed Craig was gone. And we were like... Hey, where'd Craig go? And he never came back. And his wife, Lisa, said to us, Oh, he went to bed. Now, have you ever had people over to your house and you just wanted to go to bed because they wouldn't stop talking? Probably yes. Have you actually done it? He just slipped away. And I remember thinking, Oh my goodness, that, that, we, we must have done something wrong. Maybe we made him mad or, or something. Well, he would continue to do this. Well, then, I don't know, maybe... a a few weeks later, I was talking to him on a Monday, and he says, oh, I'm really tired today. I said, what happened? He said, oh, these people from the, from the church came over, and they were at my house till 10.30 last night, and I, I just couldn't get rid of them. And I thought, wait a second. When I come over to your house, you, you slip away at 8 o'clock and don't come back down. You don't say goodnight. You don't say, hey, I'm leaving. See you later. You just disappear. You know, you slip away. We even came up with a name for this. We call it the Peter Slip. So we, we, we call it that now. We say, oh, Craig, you're going to do the Peter slip, disappear. And I said, so, so when I come to your house, you, you, go, you slip away at 8 o'clock, but, but when these people who you barely know come over, you hang out with them until 10 o'clock, what gives? And he said, he said, well, he said, you guys are family. And I thought, oh, wait a second. Because <laughs> it's like that, isn't it? When, when your family... You can just be who you want to be. You can be comfortable. You can do the things that you want to do. And you don't have to worry about the pretenses of, of the, sort of those polite relationships that you have to have. You see, that's the type of relationship, you know, that comes when you, when that familial relationship in Christ. And you can have that even with people who aren't exactly like you. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful thing. Another characteristic is that, that gospel-centered relationships are filled with grace. Proverbs 17:17 17, 17 says a friend loves at all times and, and a brother is born for adversity. I, I want you to think about that, you know, that that's that's what our friendships are are all about. They're we're filled with grace. Have you ever had that friendship with someone who you were afraid to say the wrong thing because you knew that if you did, they were going to just cut you off? Or they were going to scold you. Or it was going to be really bad for your relationship. Gospel-centered friendships aren't supposed to be like that. They're supposed to be filled with grace. Listen to how Paul puts it in Colossians 3. He says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful that the word of Christ dwell richly in you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through Him. That's gospel-centered friendship, built on grace. You shouldn't have to worry that your friends are going to ditch you because you did or said something wrong when your friendship is built on agape love. 
Another characteristic of gospel-centered friendships is that it's driven toward holiness. Think about that. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, what that means a little bit more in a few minutes. But Proverbs 27, 17 says this, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We'll talk more about that verse in a few minutes. But, but basically the idea is a gospel-centered friendship is headed in a direction. It's not just about, you know, sitting around and doing the same old thing. I was talking with someone recently about how, how uh, you know, our friendships that we could have sometimes in high school, some people can get stuck in that mode. And the same group of people can sit around and go to the same places and talk about the same things over and over and over. And it just never seems to go anywhere. And, and you know, there, it's, there's a time and a place for friendships like that where it's just super casual and, and relaxed. But sometimes your closest friendships have to be driven to somewhere. And an agape-centered friendship, a gospel-centered friendship, is going to drive you toward holiness. Consequently, the last characteristic I want to share with you is this. That these relationships are more meaningful than you can ever imagine. They're more meaningful than you can imagine. I like this proverb from 13. It says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. When you're surrounded by people... That are wise, you're going to become them. But when you surround yourself with people who are foolish, you're going to become them as well. You know, I, I was listening to a, a talk about, um, you know, entrepreneurship and business recently, and the guy who was giving the talk said this. He said, you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with in your life when it comes to your professional life, when it comes to your relational life, when it comes to you know, anything you're trying to do. And of course, when it comes to your life as, as a Christian. Take the five people that you spend the most time with and you're probably going to be right in the middle because people rub off on each other. And, and you're going to rub off on other people and they're going to rub off on you. So it's incredibly important that you think about who you're going to become friends with. And that your, your decision to become friends with someone in this agape way is intentional. So I want to share with you in that spirit something I shared with your teenagers a couple years ago. And it's a little talk I gave on how to pick your friends. And I'll tell you what, I, I, I think this is important for all of us. And as I was preparing this week, I thought, you know what, I'm going to dig that up. And I found this and I want to share it with you guys this morning. That's kind of part, the, the second part of this message this morning. How to pick your friends. If you don't need any new friends, then, then write these down and tell somebody else. Okay? First one is this. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Holy Spirit. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God, says Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Everybody wants to know how you're supposed to pick your friends. You know, when you're a kid, you're just friends with who is ever around. When, when I moved to Des Moines, when I was seven years old, the moving truck pulled up to my house... In e on the east side of Des Moines, we got out of the car, and I stood there, and within about ten minutes, all the neighborhood kids just showed up, and said, well, I guess you're the new kid. I guess you're our friend. I'm like, well, okay, these are my friends. And that's just kind of how it works when you're a kid. Somebody lives in your neighborhood, and they're a kid, they're automatically your friend. If they have a ping pong table, they're absolutely your friend, whatever it might be, you know. But as we grow, we need, to, we need to be a little more mature than that. We need to be intentional and, and be led by the Spirit of God. Back in the day, I'm going I'm I'm to tell a story from the olden days, all right? Can I do that? Summer Games, 1985. I was a camper. And at Summer Games, that's our camp that we go to. It's, it's evolved over the years. We, everyone's divided into these little groups called huddles. And the huddle's like your family for the week. You have a, a male counselor, a female counselor, and a bunch of students, and they're the kids. And that's the group that you spend all your time with. You eat together, you, you play games together, and you compete against other huddles. And it's kind of an important group of people at camp. Well, these days, because we have so many kids, all the huddles are predetermined. When you show up at camp, you're basically told, this is your huddle, just like you're told, this is where your dorm is. But back in the olden days, it wasn't so. They used to drag us out onto the basketball court, and we'd do what's called a huddle draft, okay? And they'd pull all the kids out on the basketball court, you know, they'd say, okay, all the fifth graders, line up. So you'd be drug out there, and you'd look out, and you'd see all the counselors. And then they'd just go, one, two, three, four, and the counselors would run out and grab kids, you know? 
And I remember the first year that happened to me, it was a little, a little harrowing because, you know, back in, we used to have summer games start with like fourth graders. And I remember stepping up there going, oh man, nobody's going to pick me. Because I was never picked for stuff like that. I was the little guy, you know. When I was, when I was in school, when, when, in order for me to be picked on a team in gym, I had to be attached to another person. I was a package. It was like, all right, you get him and Keith's going to. Because okay. if they just left me alone, I'd never get chosen. Well, so I'm standing there, and I'm like, I'm sure I'll be the last one picked. But you know what? I wasn't. And I stand and I wonder, who's going to pick me? And this cute girl named Amy came up, and she did this. And, and I was chosen. I was like, oh, wow, that was amazing, you know. And then you see that. And over the years, as I worked longer in summer games and became a counselor and a trainer of counselors and a pastor, ultimately, through summer games, you know, I learned that one of the things that we train people to do when you're picking your huddle is not to pick the best of the best, not to pick the tallest, most athletic kids so you can win all your games. Matter of fact, if, if we saw a huddle leader picking kids that were the most athletic, that person would be in trouble. Because we said, your job is to pray and let God pick your huddle for you. And if God picks your huddle for you, it'll be awesome. The same thing is true with your friends. Be led by the Spirit. Don't just pick who you're supposed to pick according to the world. Look for people who God wants you to be friends with. And you'll see amazing things. Secondly, how to pick your friends is you, you seek a common goal of godliness. And again, that verse from Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. You've got to have that in common, you see. When you're sharpening a piece of iron, you, you sharpen it against another piece of iron. And both pieces become sharper. One is not passive and the other is aggressive. You have to slam them both together and they'll both be affected by that. So if you want a gospel-centered, agape friendship, you have to both be in unity of spirit to say, yeah, I want our friendship to help me grow in, in godliness. You know, a lot of the world's friendships aren't so. A, a lot of the world's friendships are, 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 are not built on holiness and godliness. Toxic relationships in the world can bring out the worst in you, can't they? And there are some relationships that, that we can be involved in where it seems like that other person's job is to tear us down and, and to pull us away from God. You know, oh, let's not talk about that. Let's just talk about the Cubs or the Bears or the Eagles or the Cowboys or whatever it might be, you know. And we don't want to, we don't want this relationship to be anything serious or life giving. You're going to start talking about weird stuff. I'm out of here. You want your relationships and your friendships to have a common goal. Number three is to pick people who are real. And I think that goes without saying. We all know what that's like to be in a friendship with someone who, who you just know they're not giving you the whole story. You just know that they're not, they're not being real with you. They're, they're pretending. In First Samuel, they're trying to choose a king. And it says this, But the Lord said to Samuel, the prophet, Look not on his countenance. He was talking about who they were going to pick. He says, look not on his countenance or the height of his stature, but because I have refused him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, God doesn't care about what the world thinks in terms of who the cool kids are. God looks at a person's heart. First Peter 3, 3 and 4 says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. We should be choosing people as friends who have that inner beauty, who, who, who are real treasures in their heart, you see, because that's what's valuable to God. Number four, pick people who are humble. That, that's important, isn't it? To pick people who are humble. There's nothing more aggravating than the person who's always got to top everything you say with something they, they did. Or who takes a position of superiority over other people. So seek people who are humble. Now, that doesn't mean people who are always shy and depressing, because that's not necessarily humble. But here's a good rule. Look for someone who's nice to people that serve them. Then you find a humble person. So, translated this way. If you want to eat with somebody, and they're nice to you, but they're a jerk to the waiter, then they're just a jerk. Okay? So... Pick someone who's nice to those who, who, who are serving them. And you found someone who, who is truly humble. Okay? But when every interaction, every conversation, and every, everything is always about them, 
You know, that's not a, a true, truly humble person. So if you're always with someone and all they want to do is complain and gripe and you're just their sounding board for their complaints, recognize this. That's not a friendship. That's counseling. So next time they do it, say, thank you very much. Our time is over. And then send them a bill. I don't cut down your friends list right there, you know. Number five is pick people who are wise. Because whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, as we said, but, ever, but the commanding of fools will suffer harm. See how these things kind of line up with our characteristics? This is where it comes back. Look for people who, are, who, who, who challenge you and, and help you to grow. People, people who are honest, number six. Look for people who are honest. Proverbs 27, verse 6 says, Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Ooh, think about that. But an enemy multiplies kisses. You see, you want to be friends with someone who will tell you you got something in your teeth at dinner. Okay? You want to be friends with someone who will come up to you and say, hey, your fly's down. You want to be friends with someone who, who who will tell you what you need to hear, even if it's hard for you to hear, because they love you. Right? Watch out for people who who don't always tell you what you need to hear. Watch out for people who only want to to sort of give you half of the story. Look for people in your life to whom you can be honest with and who will be honest with you, and you found some friends. Number seven, pick people who are loving. This, of course, is pretty obvious. John 13, 35 says, By this everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another, if you agape one another. Pick people who are loving. And then number eight, this, this one's... Pretty important, I think, is pick people who are available. Now, let me talk about that for a second. Everybody can't sustain real friendships with 100 people. It's just impossible. It's hard to accept that sometimes, but it's true. And and I want you to, to, to consider that. Because sometimes if you try to be friends with someone and they don't have the ability to be friends with you, it can be a very hurtful thing. So pick people who are available. I was sitting right here at about 9.30 a couple weeks ago with some of our 412 kids. And everyone had left, and there was about four of us just sitting here talking, and they were saying to me, you know, Pastor Keith, we're really frustrated because we've been trying so hard to invite our friends to come to 412, and they just won't come. And every week I text the same kids, and I say to them in school, you got to come, you got to come, you got to come. And they keep making up excuses. And, and I don't know what we're supposed to do because we keep inviting them over and over and over again. And no matter what we do... They keep saying no. And and I I let them express that because I know it's a very frustrating thing. And then I said this to them. I said, you know, maybe it's time that you started inviting some different kids. Because you can waste your whole year trying to invite the same four friends who have already showed you who they are, that they don't want to come and that they're not going to come. And you can keep badgering them and hounding them all day long and get nowhere. Meanwhile, there are dozens of people in your life right now that would be thrilled that someone actually cared enough to invite them to church because nobody has. Adults, listen up. This is the same thing for you. Okay? Maybe you've worked up courage to, to invite someone or to be friends with someone and they've, they've turned you down for whatever reason. And you can get hung up on that or you can say, okay, God, maybe it's time for me to look someplace else. Because I guarantee you, God's got people out there for you. You know, this is is a conversation we have to have with our young people because they get so worked up about who their friends are and who they aren't. And I've had this conversation with my own kids, you know. Why won't they accept me? Why won't those kids want to be with me? Why am I always getting left out? Why am I never getting asked to do anything? Why Why am I always excluded? You know, here's what I've learned. It doesn't matter who you are, you always feel that way. Even the people that are the cool kids often feel that way. And what I think is the antidote to that is to let go of the world's ideas and expectations on who you're supposed to be friends with and who the cool people really are and let God decide that for you. Because I'll tell you something. Some of the closest friends I have in my life are not people that I would have chosen based on the world's perceptions. Not at all. Some of my closest and dearest friends are people that I have very little in common with 
from a worldly perspective. But because we know Jesus, we have this bond that is unbreakable in this world. But I understand this is an area a lot of us struggle with because we want that type of agape friendship and yet sometimes we look around and we go, I just don't experience that. You know, I want to give you one more piece of, 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 of advice here. And it's this. If that's what you want to have, then be the friend that you want to have. Be the kind of friend that you want to have. Love as you wish to be loved and do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. See, I guarantee you this. You, you attract who you are. And if you are that kind of person, then that's who you're going to attract to yourself. So be humble. Be loving. Look over that list and be every one of those things in your life. Trust in the Spirit of God with that agape light and trust that He'll bring others into that light. That's the kind of friend Jesus is to you. Remember, this agape is about the love that God has for us and that we have for Him. And He's invited us into that kind of agape with one another. So may it be so for us. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank You. We lift our hearts to You. And Lord, we crave those relationships because You are a relational God and You've created us for relationship. So help us, Lord, as John writes to us, to walk in this light that we might have fellowship. Lord, your word says that if we have that type of fellowship, then nothing can make us stumble. And Lord, that's our desire. So open our eyes to the ways that we haven't been that type of friend so that we can turn from that and repent and become that. And Lord, I pray for each and every person here today that you would open our eyes so that we could see around us those who you've called us to be in that relationship with. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.